Good evening, government. Uh, this is Mr. Barr. I wanted to just talk to you about kind of the new situation that's going to happen with our learning over the next few weeks. Obviously, this feels like day nine million of quarantine. Um, but the way this is going to go is every week uh, you're going to get two learning goals from me. Uh, they'll be posted to Google Classroom, kind of tell you what the goals are for the week. And then you're going to get a lecture video and an assignment associated with that and then an assignment that covers something else. So this week in government, you're gonna have two things you need to get done. One, uh, you're gonna watch this video and answer the questions. Two, I have a second video for you and you're gonna do something off that second video which I'll post later in the week. My goal is they're gonna be posted on Monday and on Wednesday and both of them are due on Friday. That's the goal. Um, obviously, things need to be adjusted whenever I get that. Um, just make sure if you have any questions, you reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help wherever I can. Just shoot me an email. Uh, I know it's 19, not 1999, but hey, it's the best we can do. Um, all right. First topic tonight uh, for this week is political parties. Um, political parties is a group of people with broad common interests who organize to win elections, control the government, and influence government policies. So it's a group of people with broad shared interests, essentially. Um, generally, there's two major parties in the country. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But in addition, uh, political parties have such a visible role in our democracy. A lot of people wonder what they do, and that's a fair question because sometimes it's difficult to tell what they do. Um, but the big things they do, they elect candidates. Obviously, your goal is to win an election, educate the public about issues, allow people to be involved in the political process, and hold government accountable. Uh, those are the, the four or five big things that, govern, that political parties usually do. All right. Um, if you look at the world, there's a bunch of different types of, of systems in which these political parties operate. Uh, one is pretty simple. It's a one-party system. And a one-party system means that only one party exists. Uh, usually this happens in authoritarian regimes because they tolerate no opposition. For example, there's one party in North Korea, the People's Party. There's one party in China. There's one party in Cuba. Um, so these countries that have a dictatorship or an authoritarian government have usually one party in control and only one party on the ballot. Okay? Um, some stations are de facto. Some nations are a de facto one party, meaning that they have the oper They have more than one, but really only more than one's gonna. No more than one is gonna win the election. Uh, most countries have a two party system, uh, or a multi party system. Uh, in a two party system, one of two major parties compete for power. All right. Now the United States has that. Essentially, uh, I almost guarantee you that on. I never, you never say never, but I almost guarantee you that on November the 8th, 2020, uh, the winner of the presidential election is either going to be Joe Biden, the Democrat, or Donald Trump, the Republican. That's probably who's going to win the election. Okay, um, There are other parties, and we'll get into third parties in just a minute, but real, realistically, a two-party system is one where only two, one of two major political parties has the chance to win the election. All right? In addition to that, uh, two-party systems are pretty rare across the world. Most countries have a multi-party system, and a multi-party means that there's many parties. In some countries, there's as many as 50 different parties that are on the ballot. A lot of the countries in Europe do this, the United Kingdom, Israel, Germany, and what you're voting for is you're voting for the party, and then that party elects the government. So, for example, um, if you're in the Labor Party in the United Kingdom and your party gets the majority uh, of the votes, then you you decide the prime minister, for example. Um, so it's a little bit complicated, but essentially you're voting for a party. So you could have 40% of the government is one party, 20% is this, 10% is this, and 10% is this one. It just depends on how the election turns out. Um, but that's pretty. That's where most countries are across the world. The two-party system, which again the United States has, is actually pretty rare. Um, the emergence of our two political parties really happened after the Civil War. Uh, remember, in the Civil War, we were divided over slavery. So after the Civil War, two parties emerged. Republicans uh, in the northern states controlled the presidency, Lincoln, and both houses of Congress. Uh, they tended to be the party that people flocked to after the war because they believed that they were the anti-slavery party. They didn't want to get into the politics of it. Take American history with me. You'll learn more about that. Uh, Democrats were the Southern Party. They, they were the party of the South. Uh, the Southern states were dominated by Democrats. Since 1968, uh, both parties have, have split control of houses of Congress 
and the presidency kind of off and on. Uh, but from the end of the Civil War for about the next 50 years, man, the Republicans dominated most of the country. Um, and that's just how it turned out. Um, there are third parties. So when you go to vote uh, in November, those of you that can and you should, decisions are made by those who show up. Go vote. I used to say it doesn't matter who you vote for. Make sure you vote. It matters. But bottom line is vote. That That's the key thing. Okay. Um, when you go vote in November, you're going to see a list of names on the ballot. I think in Iowa there's 12, 13. You're going to have Donald Trump, the Republican, running for re-election to the presidency. He's the incumbent, the current office holder. You're going to have Joe Biden, the Democrat, um, and you're going to have their running mates. Then you're going to have a Green Party candidate, and you're going to have a Libertarian Party candidate, and a Constitution Party candidate, and a Socialist Party candidate, and a... Um, anywhere an independent candidate probably. So you're going to have anywhere from eight to twelve uh, parties on the ballot. Now again, only more likely it's going to be either the Democrat or the Republican that wins. But a bunch of these parties are on the ballot in Iowa. Okay, and some states have ten, twenty-five candidates. It just depends on where you're at. Um, there's three types of third parties though. Okay, so these third parties are minor parties are ones that don't get a lot of attention, but they exist. And there's three types of them. One is a single issue party, focuses on a single issue. For example, the Prohibition Party in the 1920s was focused on Prohibition. Once that issue goes away, okay, then they no longer exist. They lose their thing because that's their thing. Once it's done, in this case, we passed Prohibition and we took it away. All right, But once that Prohibition Amendment got passed, that's all they needed. Okay, The other one is called an ideological party. And that... And in the ideological party, they have a specific set of beliefs about how to change society overall rather than just one single issue. So an example of an ideological party would be the Socialist Workers Party, the Communist Party. They want to make overall societal change, structural change to society. And then there's a splinter party. That's the third type of third, of minor party. Okay. Uh, they split away with one of the major parties because of disagreements over... Um, something like the failure of somebody to win the nomination. For example, the Bull Moose Party. Uh, in 1912, you had William Howard Taft, the Republican, running against Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat. Teddy Roosevelt had been a former president, disagreed with Taft's policies, thought Taft was um, spitting in the face of his legacy. So he splintered off of the Republican Party and formed the Bull Moose Party, ran as a third party, split the vote, and it allowed Woodrow Wilson to win the election. So third parties can still have an impact on the election. Okay. Minor parties do have an influence and an outcome on the election. I told you the story of, of the Bull Moose Party. Ralph Nader, okay, has run for president seven or eight times in 2000, um, earned two million votes, which swung the election, especially in Florida. He got 2% of the vote in Florida. What, Bush won Florida by like 5,000 votes or something? Right now, presumably, assuming that those all, all of Nader's votes or even a majority of them went to Gore, Gore wins Florida. So one minor third party may not win the election, but they can heavily influence the outcome of the election. Okay, the most influential third party candidate in history was a guy named Ross Perot. And he ran for president as an independent in 1992. He was a billionaire, oil tycoon from Texas, uh, southern accent, buzz cut, um, funny guy. Um, but he got 20% of the popular vote nationally. Okay, 20%, almost a quarter of the country voted for him. He's also the only third party that's ever made it into a presidential debate. He was in all three of the presidential debates in 1992. So the thing about Ross, the thing about these minor parties is you don't hear from them. Why don't you know who they are? Why is this perhaps the first time you've ever heard of them? Well, they, they face several obstacles to winning the election. Okay, first off, they have difficulty getting on the ballot in all 50 states because of lack of funding uh, and because of volunteers. The way some states work, you have to get a sig you have to get signatures, then they verify the signatures, and then you're on the ballot. Well, if you have to get, I don't know, say 30,000 signatures, it takes a lot of people to get you 30,000 signatures across the state, okay? And usually they have to be from certain a certain number from each congressional district, for example, okay? So that's a difficult thing to be able to get on the ballot. Um America has single member districts, so only one elected official represents a single area, so it's hard for third party candidates to win. Um, it's difficult to raise money. 
Now, I always hate this one because it's sort of a catch-22. For example, they can't raise money because they're not well-known, but they're not well-known because they can't raise money, right? So it's, it's sort of a catch-22, but it's the nature of the world. They can't fundraise like the Democrats and Republicans can, so it makes it difficult for them to win the election. Okay. The other problem is they can't get in the debates. After 1992, they set a rule that said you have to be at 10% in public opinion polls nationally in order to win the in order to get make it into the debates. Okay? So Ross Perot got 20% of the vote, didn't get a single electoral vote. Go back to what we talked about before we went into the quarantine. That's another reason why the electoral college is unfair. That dude got 20% of the vote and got zero electoral votes cuz he didn't win a state. Okay, so you have to be at ten percent in the polls nationally. So when they put those polls up there, and you have I don't know Biden at you know forty five and Trump at thirty two and whoever else, you have to be at ten percent in order to make the threshold to be in the debates. Well, can you imagine being in those debates gives you a huge audience, and you're on the stage with the Republican and the Democrat. All right, so it, it makes a big difference. They can't get in the debates, so they have a hard time winning the election because they can't get the attention they need. All right. Thanks for watching this video. Have a great day. It's great to be a bulldog.